Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. This is Auto Line After Hours with John McElroy, episode 232 for March 7th. Water your diesel and watch it grow. Watch Auto Line After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time or 2300 GMT. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or by following the links on our website. Well, here we are again, another After Hours. Gary, great seeing you. John, how are you? You've been having fun? I'm always having fun. <laughs> right now, too? Exactly. Couldn't be better. <laughs> and we should let everybody know that joining us right now is Frank Marcus, too. Glad to be here, as usual. Yeah. The international traveling you. Frank yeah, Marcus. Well, whatever. Yeah, so. <laughs> man of mystery. Just got back from uh, the Geneva Auto Show. And boy, are my arms tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just flew in. Yes. So what'd you like at the show? Well, you know me, I'm a little bit of a Maserati guy, but even the non-Maserati guys, one. yes, I had to admit that the Alfieri was the coolest looking car at the show. Uh, beautiful, you know, it's, this is the 100th anniversary of Maserati, and this is their birthday present to themselves, and they're looking forward. And but it's a concept. Are they going to do it? It's a concept, but, you know. Looks production. Uh, my, our colleague, Paul Horrell, whips out on his smartphone and goes, hey, yeah, did you, didn't you see this thing they've showed to their analysts? And there, there's that car in, like, 2016, 80,000 euros. So they say in there, oh, and maybe, and if the demand is there, but it's already in the plan, apparently. So, yeah. yeah, good. And it's additive. It's not replacing the Gran Turismo, which is getting a little old. Um, and yet it's sort of resembling of Kind it. of, but, I mean, it's much, it's the, got one of those back seats like a 911. You're only going to put your briefcase there, uh, whereas the, you can really sit in the back of the Gran Turismo. So it is an additive product. You know, that, that company has really come an awful long way since the 90th anniversary when I went to their program in Europe and they had like, you know, two cars and whatever. And now they've just, you know, 150% up in sales, you know, huge jump in sales. Yeah. Amazing. E even in just the last year, right. big jump in yeah. sales. And the SUV hasn't even come on board yet. So well, that yeah. SUV is, well, what's the matter with that? I mean, that I don't know why. Well, remember, it was the Kubang. At yeah. Point it was going to be built at the Jefferson yeah. plant in Detroit. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know where it is now. No, it's, they're going a little quiet on that. So they didn't talk about that at no, all or have anything, any that. evidence of that? No. Okay, enough of Maserati. That you like that. Mistake. What about the Jeep Renegade? I'm more interested the in Renegade, that. The Renegade, yeah, that's going to really be a big game changer for them. Uh, you know, the boss of Jeep, uh, Mike Manley, is also in charge of International, and that is going to be a huge play internationally, built in Melfi, in, uh, Italy, on the same line that the 500L is, although the cars are not really all that similar. They're the same architecture. They're built in the same equipment and whatever. But the, No resemblance. Not any that. resemblance on the outside. You won't find any parts. You recognize the crash box is wider because they got got 2.4 liter in that car that doesn't go in the 500, which is just too big to fit in the other one. It's got strut rear suspension to accommodate the all-wheel drive, which, you know, you got a twist beam in the other one. So a lot of, real, even the electrical architecture had to be completely changed to accommodate all the gear on but, the Jeep. But you got a chance to drive it? No drives yet, uh, coming soon. And I asked Mike, you know, will it do the Rubicon? And he said, well, he was real cagey on that. But it's the, sa it's, but it's the same platform that they're using for a multitude of cars, right? And here, Ben's got uh, some video of it running up. On yeah, the see, it drives on dirt like a champ. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Um, you know, it looks good. It, um, it's got the nine-speed automatic. It's perky. Yeah, fun. You know, the removable roof, two, two roof panels come out and so forth. And yeah, I think it's going to be a big hit. And you know... I, uh, my knee jerk was to think that the, the traditionals will all say it's a car based little tiny thing and the, we hated the Patriot and this will be even worse. I think, though, the reality is this is a more serious car. I think it'll go off road better. They've got a, a you know, Trailhawk package with a low range button, which, in fact, really, they've just got a, a lower final drive. And so, first gear has a really low qual crawl ratio and it just keeps it in first gear more when you're doing that. But I think I, I wouldn't be shocked if it did go over the Rubicon, you know. They'll at least have with, one that'll go over the Rubicon. Yeah, with, with a Grand Cherokee and a winch in front of it. 
<laughs> yep. <laughs> what I think, think is so interesting from a design standpoint is the round headlamps. Yeah. I mean, of, now, of course, that's a signature Jeep look sure. to it. But, you know, most designers these days, and we got Ralph Gilles coming up in the next week or two. We'll ask him about it. But, you know, most designers are loath to go with simple round headlamps these days. Well, I, is there, I, 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 was talk, I was talking to Mark Allen, who is the um, head of Jeep Design, um, when we saw that earlier. And um, I asked him, I said, are the round headlights a reaction to what some people are saying about the Cherokees? Um, rectangular those led sort of light yeah. and and he said he said absolutely not these two vehicles were in the studio at the same time look you know so this is a small jeep but they point out it's the same size as the cj was so the more lines we draw to that car round headlights how bad the interior room of the cj was well there you go and this will be way bigger than that on the inside uh the removable roof look that you can paint the roof black and it kind of looks like it comes off you know there's a, they're doing a lot of those things to, to you know draw a connection to, to the cjs and so forth of the past so yeah and the, did you get a chance to look in the interior because i saw the, yeah. the, the the you know the bucks for the interior boy that looked great yeah they're neat they've got these anodized things that look like clamps military clamps you know Clamping the radio to the console and clamping the shifter to the floor and clamping the st speakers to the door and stuff like that, you know. But it's kind of neat, you know, and the color touches that, that dress it up. They've all learned that, you know, just acres of shiny black plastic is not work. really going to work anymore. So, and, and that's a big play for their other markets as well. I mean, China is a big uh, opportunity because, you know, Manly's. Yeah, although China and Brazil, they'd love to sell zillions of them in both places, but the tariffs are such that until you build them locally, that's not really in play. Yeah. And I asked him, will they sell more outside than inside the U.S.? And Mike said, well, if you just look at the, the B segment, you would expect 65% of Europe and 35% North America. But he said, you know, and it's maybe it's wishful thinking, but he really hopes that this car will lure people you know, into that market that aren't in it now when they see that, hey, with the nine speed and with the rear axle, it disconnects on the all wheel drive. You can get pretty close to hatchback little sedan gas mileage with this extra utility and, and so forth. So, um, you know, maybe. Did, did they talk pricing at all? I don't think they've made any I mean, a firm ball yet. Park sort of uh, 20s, you know, yeah. To start, I think. Yeah, depending on where they price it, mm -hmm. will determine how many, at least in the U.S. market, how many right. people go for it. Exactly. Right, because I mean, the the walk on the Cherokee gets pretty high pretty quickly, and uh, yes, it does. So, yeah, you, you got to believe that they have to have something yeah. that would. They'll advertise that twenty-three thousand dollar front drive, you know, one point four liter six speed, you know, a lot. So. Mm -hmm. What else did you see at the show you like? Well, Lamborghini Huracan was there. You know, it seems like there's a lot of rich people in Switzerland. So there's <laughs> all, an awful... All the exotic tuner companies. Yeah, they really do. <laughs> Crazy. And new ones like this Zenvo that has this 6.8 liter turbocharged and supercharged, you know, 1,300, I forget what, 1,000 horsepower, whatever, 1055, I think it was. And then, of course, Koenigsegg rolled out their 1.1, which is one horsepower per kilogram Wow. Yeah. So, you know, 1340, and that's metric horsepower, so PS, but still, still very makes cool. the math real easy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of cool stuff. Like that. And then on the other end of the scale, you know, Toyota's little iGo, mm -hmm. which is on the C1, Citroën, and, and Renault. Uh, no, uh, uh, Peugeot 108. Uh, yeah, 108, and Citroën C1. C1, yeah. But and the the Igo has this interesting kind of black X graphic on the front of the car. The little X's go all the way up to the the mirrors, you know. It's very dramatic for Toyota. You know, we all kind of thought, oh, neat. And of course, Renault had their rear engine, you know, smart. Yeah, what do you make of that? Twingo. What yeah. do you guys make of that rear engine? Uh, does I mean, but doesn't the, does the shape of that car look? I mean, it looks totally, like, yeah, it totally quotidian to me. It looks like everything else. And yeah, so it totally hides the fact that it's got a rear engine. They've still got a big box in the front, which you can't really do much with, apparently. I didn't open it, but apparently there's just a cooling module and not much space up there. And I don't know. I heard one time that a, a, someone got a few drinks in a smart engineer back in the beginning of that thing and who let, you know, slip that there's nothing wrong with this car that moving the engine to the front wouldn't have fixed. You know, and they had all those dynamic problems they were fixing with it. So I'm a little surprised to see this. Of course, Renault has a lot of rear engine history. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes the Dauphine and, you know, right. the Alpine Renaults and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know. 
We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Exactly right. You know, rear engine was a big thing in the 30s. Yeah. You know, and yeah, Volkswagen had a bit of a run with it, and you're right, Renault did too yeah. in the 50s. But man, I, I just yeah. find that a little. And if I find it odd, if there's not much storage space up front, then what the hell are you putting the yeah. engine in the back? What's the purpose? And it doesn't look anywhere near as interesting as the original Twingo, which was right. super cute. I mean, this right. one just kind of looks a little like a lot of other things to it me. Reminded me of an old 500. I mean, kind of old. Yeah. So they're, they're trying to be, you know, mini 500 cute and whatever. And uh, I don't know. I wasn't blown away by that one. So did you see the Quant E Sport limousine? I did. And I want to know a lot more about that car than what their chief technical officer was willing to tell me on the stand. But this is the car with the, it's a fully electric with a liquid battery system where you f fill up with these two ionic liquids. They, they say electrolyte, but they're really ionic liquids, a, a positive charge and a negative charge one. They run past this, this membrane and make electrons. And then some catalyst takes the ionic whatever out and boils off the liquid and it just goes away and you just refill when you're out of, out of electrons, you know. Or as they say in the official press release, the reason that the nano flow cell, that's what it's called, <laughs> performs so well lies in the characteristics of its newly developed electrolytic fluids made up of exacting combinations of specific metallic salts at very high concentrations. That sort of hey, they're not telling you um, anything about what the, the what the chemistry are is of those. The charge carriers within the carrier liquid have been taken to a new level of charge density through the use of quantum chemical nanomechanisms. Oh, and therefore right. but carry the, the, more. I say uh, that again. I just want to hear you say it. Yeah, I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's where the quant comes from. Look, the the, uh, the the idea was patented in '76 for NASA, actually. So, I mean, there's real science there. I just don't know what it is yeah, yet. Yeah, but I remember when we had, uh, who's the CTO at Delphi? Jeff Owens. Yeah. When we had Jeff Owens here, we were asking him about it. Why, why can't you just put a new electrolyte instead of having to plug this thing into a wall or something? And he says, oh, you can do it. It's, it's been done. He says, but it, it degrades the battery so fast. Well, that, yeah, and that's a different technology, uh, totally. The, the lead plates and whatever with an electrolyte, that's, that's one electrolyte making a reaction, and, and electrons are going in and out of it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the out, if you only have the ins, that's when it ruins it. Mm. This is a whole totally different thing where you've got the two uh, fluids on either side of this Kind of like a fuel cell membrane, sort of, although he wouldn't tell me what that was made out of either. They, they describe it as being like cling wrap. So yes. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of... Wrap in the middle there. That's another technical term. It is. Yeah. They should have called it nano cling wrap. Yes. <laughs> but it's an interesting idea because the car is bigger than a Tesla. And they, of course, they described it as having Formula One performance, which I'm like... Well, see, but... No, no. <laughs> okay, just no. <laughs> see, but the thing, the, what I thought was interesting is, is that they talk about having two 200-liter tanks... On the car. Is that all? And I mean, and that. The back end is ate up with gas it, tanks. I mean, that ain't light, okay? Because if, cause if you basically do the conversion, I mean, you're talking about. Uh, if these salts are in high concentration, more, more than they than aren't eight, gonna be lighter than water. Well, yeah, I mean, if you do water, it's like more than 800 pounds. And then they're saying that, you know, you can get more range. Um, increasing the tank volume of the Quant E Sport limousine to 800 liters would be relatively simple. So well, it is huge. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, well, I guess you just fill the rocker panels or something with yeah. it. You know? So it's a very interesting concept. You know, I'm, they're based in Liechtenstein. Somebody's got to be yeah. Liechtenstein. I think they must be just skimming off a little percent of all those mailbox corporations that run their profits through that little country, you know? I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. But the uh, Nano Flow Cell AG Simulation Lab and the Nano Flow Cell Digilab are in Zurich. Yeah. I, I always wonder when you see, you know, things described like that or, you know, the patented by NASA in 1976. I'm sure NASA has probably patented, like, everything at one point in time. So you used to remind me, I'd get calls from guys who'd call me and say, you know, we got a machine, you know, General Motors bought it. I'm like, well, General Motors basically bought one of everything. You know what I mean? It's just like, it doesn't mean that that's their... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But another cool tech thing was this EDAG uh, oh, yeah, yeah. additive manufacturing monocoque structure 3D idea. printer. They basically 3D printed it, I think mostly with uh, selective laser melting of this titanium. I think it's a, I, I can't remember it anyway. Oh, it's metallic? It's metal, yeah. Ooh. Um, and it's, they, they were pointing out that you can do sort of bionic design this way. So this thing had a... Oh, here. Uh, yeah, it had a, a like a, a tortoise uh, look to the, sh you know, tortoise shell design. And the skin is like a, a, uh, upper and lower is like a sandwich with a lot of little tiny struts in it, which you could never 
I mean, I guess you could loss foam cast it or something would be ridiculous to try and do that. But with additive manufacturing, that's easy. Now, we're just a super long way from making this happen. For one thing, you would probably have to do some dramatic heat treatment to all that because the crystal structure when you make metal that way is brittle. Um, so it's, it, but they were pointing out that for comp- a lot of components, this dramatically reduces the manufacturing trouble. Because when it's done, it's done. You don't have yeah. to machine or anything. Nothing. Yeah, no people, no, just one thing. Here it, it well, comes, you know. So we used to do a magazine about this, and so I was the editor of that magazine. So um, there's actually a company in Manitoba um, Core Ecologic that actually has a car, the Irby, which is a printed car, entirely printed. And it's a three-wheel car. It's a hybrid. I mean, it works. I mean, these guys have done this, and so it exists. And what they're actually doing is that the Irby 2, not, so, so the Irby 1 has a body shell that's printed. Irby 2 is going to have the interior printed as well as the interior printed. So, so you're, you're doing this whole thing. But the thing of it is, is that, um, you know, there is finishing involved because these things are not giving you a class A surface by any stretch of the imagination. No. So, I mean, unless you're, unless you're doing this so slowly that you would not be alive. Well, I don't think you want a titanium exterior anyway. Or, but if you make the monocoque this way and you apply your composite panels and, and so forth, and it's just the design for manufacturer and the worry about getting a tool in there or pulling a mold out or getting the sand to fall out, none of that. That all just goes away. Mm-hmm. You know? And uh, to me, that's really neat. You know? And they, they said it's going to revolutionize, you know, reduce by a factor of 100 or 1,000 the, the complexity of making stuff, you know, so. Well, certainly prototyping it, you know. It, well, we've been doing that a long time. They're really saying time. the next thing is we, we want to try to build really? stuff this way. Yeah. Whoa. So. Well, EDAG does a lot of uh, one-offs and concept right. cars and things like that. So. Yeah, it's a big engineering consultancy. Yeah. And they just bought someone else. they got like 7,000 engineers now. They're, they're one of the Do biggest. They really? Yeah. That's as big as a lot of car companies. Yeah, right? Whoa. So when there's a will and 7,000 <laughs> engineers, yeah. there's a way. Yeah. <laughs> But melting that stuff with a laser takes a hell of a long time unless you've got a hell of a big laser. So uh, I'm not so optimistic about that stuff. I mean, uh, well, we don't need to necessarily make Corollas this way, but oh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe we make, you know, some super exotic yeah. to begin with. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you could like turtles. break it into sections. You know, you don't have to have one machine make the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If, yeah, we're not going to find volume. powder beds that big. So there's going to be, or, but you do that. The deposition of FDM, I forget what the F is, anyway. Fused, fused deposition model. Ma- ma- yeah, that one. Boy, I'm glad I hang that out. That doesn't I require a, a bed. You can, you can, but do they do that with metal yet? I, uh... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just and, starting uh, research on it, Well, it's sort of interesting, because, I mean, and this, this technology, and this is one of the technologies that was actually established in the United States, which makes it somewhat interesting, but, uh, but. Um, this FDM? Yeah. I, I seem to recall it came out of Texas way back when, but uh, so the, the, there's um, two big companies now. One is Stratasys, which is up in Minneapolis, and I think that's who EDAG might have been working with on this. And then there's another one, 3D Systems, which is down in uh, North Carolina, and uh, those two have basically like absorbed practically all of the different companies that make this stuff. And so, like, um, um, but a lot of the attention is is on home you know, printing of stuff of, you know, like how many iPhone cases do you need? Print your own, that sort of thing. Yeah. And uh, um, that's where a lot of that stuff is, is going to. But um, some of these companies, there's uh, this company, Israeli company, Object, and you can print wheels for cars. I mean, and like this big, I mean, they're just... What? Yeah. And they're strong? They're strong, but they're not strong enough. Mm. So... But again, I wouldn't want to corner hard, hard and do a whole no, show for, on that. But I mean, for modeling purposes, that okay, you, yeah. you'd actually have the physical thing rather than mm-hmm. just looking at something on right, the screen. Right. Because, uh, um, but smaller parts are actually being used in some production applications, and a lot of airplane parts now are being printed. Yeah, I want to say, uh, isn't GE working on printing nozzles for jets? Yeah, in, in turbine blades, and uh, so they bought a company down in Cincinnati. Um, Morris Technologies, and so um, GE Evendale's down there, and so they bought this company, and this company, that's what they specialize in doing that stuff, and so they bought it, you know, specifically for that reason, and um, it's, it's interesting, absolutely, but uh, I, I, I think that 
the hype exceeds the reality. It's, it's, it's sort of like robotics in the early days and, uh, you know, when basically they were, you know, big stupid things that could spot weld and, uh, or, or load, you know, um, forging machines and, you know, but no, they're going to take over the world. Well, still waiting. <laughs> Anything else at Geneva? Ferrari introduced turbocharging, of course, back to the you know, F40 days with the California T. Kind of, kind of a biggie. What else? And of course, Jag showed its three series competitor just on a video screen. They didn't have a car there. The XE, XE yes. So with their new line of engines and everything in that, so Jag's doing a pretty good job. Jaguar Land Rover, you I know. know. Once again, it looks like Ford jumped off of that bandwagon just as it was really getting some altitude, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and they're doing well globally too. I yeah. Mean, so. Uh, they might pull it out yet. I think they will, yeah. I'll just be able to do it. Yeah, they just built an, an engine plant in the West Midlands, I think, yeah. to, for that for car. four-cylinder engines, yeah. a family of four-cylinders. Yeah. So, yeah, Jag's doing some pretty good stuff. And, stuff. of course, they had uh, the Cadillac CTS-V wagon fighter there, the XFRS wagon. Ooh. <laughs> we don't get that here, unfortunately, but... 550 horsepower. Mm. Yeah. Your wagons, did you see the Volvo wagon? Very nice, yeah. yes. Gorgeous. That, it looks just like the other ones I've had in the last couple of shows, mm -hmm. uh, building on that same design aesthetic, and it looks beautiful. They desperately need new product. That's all Volvo needs right now. So do you think that might be one that they got off the bandwagon too early with, too, or...? Well, the jury, jury's a little further out on that one, especially as regards the market acceptance of an all-four-cylinder strategy. And yeah, you can get three or 400 horsepower once you turbocharge it and supercharge it and you put a hybrid with it and whatever, but, you know, will people think four cylinders is enough for a, you know, D-segment car if they re redo the, v the 80, you know, I, we'll see. We'll Hope see. so, you know. They have a lot of catching up to do. Kind of, yeah. A lot. I mean, they have to just about replace everything in their yeah. lineup. But they have that engine strategy. I mean, the engine, I, you know, drove it, and I thought it was perfectly adequate for mm -hmm. purpose. And uh, In the cars they're in now, they're fine. It's it was when what, they get uh, bigger ones. 60? Yeah. And uh, so it's like eight engines and diesel as well as, as um, petrol that, they have this whole strategy that that basically you know they're using many of the same parts to reduce the uh, investment. Yeah, that'll be necessary. Well, you know, the styling is is meant to show us what the new big SUV is going to look like, and I just wonder if that in that package, the, you oh, know, the four yeah. cylinders is going to be enough. You know, and isn't that isn't that the first one that they they're going to have hybridized? I think. That oh, was, I hope so. Know. I think you're going to need it uh, on yeah. that. You know, yeah. so. What else, Gary, did you pick up on this week? I see you got a bunch of sales well, I, numbers. Well, I, I thought right? the sales, I mean, I thought the sales numbers were, were very interesting. I mean, speaking of the big uh, SUV, it seems that uh, unless you were selling a, a, a CUV or, or something along those lines, cars just almost entirely across the board. We're down. We're just down everywhere. I mean, whether it's, you know, um, you look at for... Uh, you know, the Accord was down, the Civic was down. The Prius, the, what the hell's going on with the Prius? The sales of that thing are dropping like a rock. Yeah, well. And this is not the first month, this is, this is a multi-month well, drop. See, what, what, I found, what I found to be more astonishing than perhaps that is if you look at Toyota car sales, okay, just the, the cars, that they only had um, two cars that, that are basically up for February over last February, that's the Corolla's up 1.2%, and the Scion XD is up 11.1%. Their newest car yeah. and their oldest one. Is, I mean, I, I had a hard time remembering what the hell the XD was. Well, maybe are the numbers so small that they you are, get a the big percentage? 662 were yeah. sold. Okay, well, there you go. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. I mean, everything is, is down. I mean, um, and... Uh, you know, for the year, the Chrysler 300 is off 26%, and that the 200, which is going away, is, is basically, um, you know, accounting for nearly half of all Chrysler brand sales. And, you know, because, well, they only have the... They only have three products. They only have the town and country is the other thing, the minivan, and, uh, you know, that's... Chugging along 1% increase for the year and 1% for the month. But Chrysler as a company was up and up strong, but it was all due to the new Cherokee. 
Um, yeah, the Cherokee. Well, but since there was nothing to compare, there was nothing to compare, compare it against. But they, yeah. but they sold uh, eleven thousand seven hundred ninety-five last month and twenty-two thousand three hundred so far this year. So that is um, second only to the Grand Cherokee, and um, that was twenty-four thousand eight hundred ninety-eight units. So, so Jeep is just so if they have this this new little one. Um, you got to believe. I, I that think gonna, they'll be off to the race. You're going to be doing even better, but I mean, and uh, you know, you look at like uh, Dodge sales whoosh, down, yeah. exce except for, for the Ram or oh, well, that's Durango. Ram. The yeah. Durango is is selling well. SUV and uh, the uh, Dodge Caravan. Um, in in Cadillac, everything is down with the exception of SRX. Hey, speaking of Cadillac, have you guys seen this ad that's generating so much controversy? of this sort of in your face, you know, you know, the French may take a week a month off, but you know. Yeah, I I finally after seeing that being posted about the ninth time on Facebook, had to go ahead and watch it and I thought, I you know, I don't know that I have such a big problem with it. Okay, maybe I'm just jingoistic by nature. <laughs> maybe I work my butt off all the time and I'm a little, you know, you identify testy with the about the, everybody getting a month off. You know, I can kind of see that now. Yeah, I, okay, maybe it's not nice to push that in people's faces, but I didn't really have a problem with it. I, I, just, I just think it's, it, I'm driving an ELR right now, and that ostensibly is the car that's being advertised oh, absolutely. in this commercial, right. right? I mean, because he drives off in the thing. And, and I think that it does a profound disservice to the car, because I think that people ought to know more about that car than they know about you know, what it takes to earn that car. And, I, I guess I they're just trying to say, you probably need to be filthy rich because this is like a $90,000 volt or whatever it is, you know. 75. 75, whatever. <laughs> 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 With a few options. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, I don't know. But, I, I mean, but I, I, I mean, I honestly... The other curious thing about it is that it, it is going to sell to green progressives who are probably less likely to identify with that fella. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of troubling from a few it's ways like that. That, that. that actor Neil, Neil McDonough had actually been a character in Justified, which was written by Elmore Leonard, Detroit guy. And uh, so, so he played a criminal from Detroit who was, who was down in... Uh, so it just it just seemed like wow that's that's not really good casting for people who watch other fans. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think the ad works on a couple of levels and doesn't on certain others. It works on one level. Here we are talking about it. In fact, so much of the media is talking about this ad. Cadillac's got to be over the moon that that ad has generated so much attention. Uh, to your point, though, Gary, yeah, it's it's like well. What's this ad about? Here's this guy saying, you know, he's almost ticked off. He's almost pissed off, you know, the way he's talking about yeah. things. And the, the surprise is he walks up to a car and then you learn it's a Cadillac and it's plugged in. So I think that's where a lot of people go, huh, a Cadillac that you plug in? What's this car about? But, you know, to me, uh, they're on the right track. Cadillac is historically been an in-your-face brand top of the line, if you can't afford it, get the hell out of here kind of an attitude. And, and they're hitting on that. But I think they crossed a little too far. You know, luxury should be about having something more than others do or that others cannot quite get, but not necessarily being snotty about it. And I, I think the ad Although may it's sort of be snotty a, about foreigners, uh, you know, that are still living in a foreign place. It, it's not really... You know, the ones who've come here obviously have the work ethic because that's why they came. With the, you know, I mean, it's kind of a, but we're I mean, not selling that car over there much, at least not with this ad at all. So, but I mean, the thing, the thing that I sort of wonder about is, is does anybody say to themselves, you know, those Germans are lazy. I'm not going to buy a BMW <laughs> or that, you know, they're, they're, you know, I'm not going to buy a Mercedes Audi. They're all, and, and so, so basically I think the ones that Americans tend to think are lazy are French <laughs> and and yeah. what do they sell us? You know, I mean, how many Renaults are we buying? We're perfectly happy to buy their cheese and wine. Yeah, but I mean, it's just like, so, so I mean, so I, I miss the point there. I mean, in the way the guy's talking, it's like a David Mamet piece that, I mean, he's just going at it, at it, at it, at it. And, uh, you know, we're waiting for him to offer a set of steak knives for um, whoever's not going to work for uh, an entire month. Um, you know, yeah. the whole Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross thing going. And, uh, but again, it's just like, if 
is 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 you know is is it all about the reward and is the car the reward and you know is is that what you aspire to buying a car and uh because you know, he walks by his kids and his kids are doing something that's like Argh! and and goes and changes clothes magically. And, and see, that's the problem, it seems, because he changes his clothes like Superman, you know, because he's got the shorts on, goes in, comes out, he's got a suit on. So when you see the plugged-in car, you say, huh, this must be the future. <laughs> in the future, you'll change clothes very quickly, and you'll have cars that are plugged into the wall. I don't know. i not a fan. Well, we'll watch and see what happens once the snow melts if it moves at, uh, moves cars. Because as much as I hated all the Ron Burgundy ads that they used for the Dodge Durango, God, did that work. I mean, say, the, the minute that ad hit the TV, boom, sales just <laughs> See, I, I think they have got it going on the best as far as figuring out ads. I mean, look at how the Super Bowl ad three years ago moved 200s, which were just, you know. Still moving 200s. Yeah. There was no good reason to go buy one of those. And that ad came out and the sales just went kaflu right through the roof, you know. Right. And so someone there needed a big raise. Yeah. Olivier Francois, yeah. right? I mean, this is the guy who's, you know, just been hitting them out of the park left, right, and backwards. Mm -hmm. so, so we'll see if this Cadillac ad works. You know, maybe in another month we'll know. See, what I think the thing is, 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 you know, the ELR is going to be such a limited production, low volume thing anyway. So it's, you know, we're not going to see like, whoa, that really moved the needle. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, maybe just the availability of the car will move the needle. That's that sort of a thing. Um, but, uh, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, we're talking about it and this is giving Cadillac a lot more uh, um, time. And, and as you said, you saw it on Facebook multiple a times. A zillion times. It's like yeah. everywhere. Ad Age has been doing it. And, you know, yeah. everybody's been all over this thing. And, Most uh, of them, it was people being all, you know, indignant about it. And I, that's why I'm like, all right, what's the big indignant thing here? You know, and I didn't get that. See, but maybe that says something else about like all the other car ads that are just so innocuous that you don't even, you don't even know. It's just right. like, it's like yeah. wallpaper. No, it yeah. is. that's and, true. Uh, it's, and that's and so these guys, and you know, so the Ron Burgundy thing, I mean, you know, here he is making fun of the product and, you know. <laughs> Speaking of ads that I think just didn't work at all for me and which they are real proud of and showed on the Geneva stand, that Maserati Super Bowl ad where you didn't even know what product it was for until the last yeah, 10 that's seconds. Even, that didn't work for me even a little tiny bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> But and you're the Maserati guy. I know. I did not sell me on that car. I thought, come hey, on. Look, why don't we take a, a quick short break to give a shout out to our good sponsor, Firestone. And then let's talk about Dieter, diesel water emulsion. So then let's, let's go to Firestone. Introducing a car company that's never made a single car. Legendary durability. Impressive mileage. Firestone tires. So unstrap the saddle. These old stallions are ready to run. Again. Whatever you drive, drive a Firestone. Whether it's on television, online, or through social media, AutoLine knows how to effectively get your marketing message to the people you want to reach. Contact Stacy Eman today. Okay, we're back here, and we're joined right now with Calvin Visser. I said that right, didn't I? Calvin Visser, yes. From Fierce Fuel Systems. Yes. So, welcome to the show, number one. Thank you. And now uh, we've been pushing this, you know, hyping this show all week long, talking about diesel water emulsion. It's, it, am I using the right terminology? Yes, that's it. Yes. And this is all about putting water in diesel fuel. Exactly. Okay, you take it from there. Exactly. Because <laughs> I don't understand how this works at all. D diesel fuel is a very uh, uh, complex uh, uh, fluid, of course, that, that uh, has come a long way in the, in the recent uh, years here with ultra-low sulfur diesel. So what we have found is combining this new fuel with some old, old technology. Diesel water emulsion started, documented in 1931 by our, our uh, research. And what it essentially is, is taking diesel fuel and a metered amount of water and typically a small amount of surfactant or an emulsifying agent. Which means what? Explain that a sec. Which is a chemical that will allow the interfacial tension of the water and the diesel to blend. So typically oil and water do not mix. Uh, so if you were to pour diesel and water and put it in a blender, you'll see it separate very quickly. 
when you add an emulsifier to it, it will stay in suspension. So they're little water... Little bitty water so droplets. Floating around in there? Exactly. So the, the holy grail of diesel water emulsion is to get smaller water droplets. Now the combustion chemistry behind this is that you, you've heard of LTC, low temperature combustion. So the idea is if you have small water droplets in your fuel, it is injected into the combustion chamber on a compression ignition engine, and those little water droplets will become superheated, go to steam, and then the hydrogen uh, helps to burn more efficiently the hydrocarbon chain, and the oxygen allows the nitrous oxide radicals to burn off quicker. And you also, of course, water doesn't have any uh, BTUs to add to the ignition process. Uh, so the water actually lowers the temperature of combustion, which also helps you produce less nitrous oxide uh, radicals. So you're saying that it's dissociating the water? So you're getting hydrogen and oxygen? When it goes to steam and, and it's combusting, that's what's happening. Okay, because I thought the part of it is also is that the, when that steams, it, it uh, atomizes the diesel, it, too, or it, it, it kind it, of explodes, explodes the diesel. Out, yeah. Explodes it out, and we get this from a lot. There's a lot of scientists around the world that have and still are working on this, and that's where we're gaining most of this, this research. Now, the, the basis of this, this system, uh, our CEO, Louis Conti, uh, a good story, ran into a guy by the name of Dr. Alexander Kravstoff on LinkedIn. And uh, he was looking for supporters, and, and Lou found this fellow with this invention that was looking to sell it, of course, and market it. So, so Lou found investors. We have a great investor group out of Medford, Oregon, that came alongside us and, and said, okay, what can we do with this? So we put a package together. He has this, if, if you've ever heard, you've, you are familiar with the term cavitation, mm -hmm. which is a very destructive force. So cavitation, sonoluminescence, which is a, a chemistry field where when, thing, when, a, when a bubble uh, uh, expands and implodes, it actually gives out light, believe it or not. Mm. You can see this, a pistol shrimp is a common example of that, where it snaps its jaws so quick it emits light and this sonic cavitation uh, noise that kills the fish as they, as they go by and he eats them. So what, what the doctor, Dr. Kravstoff has done is said, okay, let's focus this cavitation, which is normally something you want to stay far away from, on the diesel fuel itself. And when you do that, you are able to mix or homogenize these things very to a, to a great level. So, so what has happened is we said, okay, let's apply this to fuels. Now we have patents on, on fuels, on mixing uh, pharmaceuticals, so things that you don't have to shake ever and it just stays in emulsion. There's applications for wastewater remediation, theoretically speaking. So, so of course, we look at the market, and, and when you have a product, you have to commercialize it somehow, and that's where we got into the diesel fuel. So learning that diesel fuel, since about 2006 or 2007, turned in from low-sulfur diesel to ultra-low-sulfur diesel, ULSD, uh, that made it so when they make that diesel fuel, they have to desulfurize it, which is a, a very difficult process. So they use things called hydrocracking, and it's a catalyzed process. So it, it makes it so it's sort of denuded of its sulfur. So it lacks for lubricity. It's more hygroscopic, meaning it wants to take on water. And so here you have this diesel fuel that when it comes out of the refinery, it's pretty good stuff, but when it goes into a, in a tanker truck, a tanker, a railroad car, to a tanker truck, to a 20,000 gallon tank in the middle of nowhere, in this cold and, and, and warm cycles, it's, it's gathering water and gathering all kinds of things. And they talk about uh, uh, microbial-induced corrosion. So there's little things that, in most tanks, water's going to separate to the bottom. And your diesel fuel and the little bugs live at the interface, and they eat it and live and die. Uh, so, so regardless, you get this fuel in your, in your vehicle. Now, of course, today, we have all kinds of new technology in diesel engines. So we're seeing high pressure common rail engines that are pushing, uh, what, 30, 40,000 PSI. So we see the Euro 4, Euro 5, Euro 6 regulations for lower emissions. And, and what happened is if you, if you look through and do some research, you'll see diesel water emulsions kind of started to take off 
And big companies like Aquazol and Lubrizol actually jumped on the bandwagon. It's, it's EPA approved, it's CARB approved. Uh, so it was going forward and what they would try to do is mix a big batch of it and try to draw off it for, for three or four months and hope that would work. Well, what happens is oil and water still don't mix. So if you turn your engine off, you, you essentially separate the, the, the water will come out of separation, out of the, out of the amount. Because the heat affects the surfactant then? Oh yeah, yeah okay. hey, oh, heat, heat's amazing. And, and yeah. so, so when you let it cool off, then, then it goes back. So, so what we have done is come up with, with two systems. One takes your fuel and emulsifies it only. So it's going through this, this uh, reactor tube and, and cavitating it. So that takes any water that's already in the diesel fuel that's all, and they have a lot of additives when they process the diesel fuel. So, so the point is, you, you're getting diesel fuel, you think it's clean, but it's got a lot of stuff in it. So when we run these tests, we see, well, we get, we get certified fuel, that, that, does, that works great, that's pretty, pretty good as it sits. Then we get something that's been sitting around a while, and we get better results. So we put these units on class eight over the road semi trucks, and lo and behold, on, on a dynamometer, we get five, six percent. Then we put them on trucks and these what do you guys- mean five, six percent of what? Of uh, fuel efficiency, so it's burning that much less fuel. So this Meaning is after the cavitation? After the cavitation. Just taking water out of the diesel fuel. We're, we, what we are actually doing is mixing it- Mixing in, it in better. Mixing it in better, uh, which is kind of the bane of high pressure common rail diesel engines. So, so we said, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's commercialize this somehow. So we make these units that fit on the back of class eight semi trucks or on the side rails so that you can emulsify the fuel and it's, take it out of the truck tank, emulsify it and burn it. And, the, and, and these trucks- So you're just using the water that's already there. In that case, in that case. So we found out, well, that works pretty good. We're getting guys that say, I can't live without it. I mean, guys that say 12, 16, 18%. We're going, gee whiz, that's amazing, are you sure? Yeah, that's, you know, they, okay, we want them, fine. So we took it one step further and look into this diesel water emulsion and said, well, if they used to do it, why don't they do it anymore? Because, and the byproduct again is, picture 60 to 80% less particulate matter or soot, which typically, and here's where the, the science, uh, technology levels, which right now, uh, diesel, most diesel uh, trucks have what they call a, a diesel particulate filter, DPF, uh, which has, it collects it and then it injects diesel fuel and then it ignites it at a high temperature and gets rid of it. And then they also have a, a selective catalyst reduction system to, to sequester the, the NOx, if you will, and then you use urea to burn that off. So, if you, so the key is those are expensive things. So, so water emulsion actually lowered those, not to the level that California wants right now, but it lowers it quite a bit. So, so as it went through, and, and California is a leader on this, as well as the Germans come up with a lot of these things, and, and we saw that technology and then it fell off. And then you saw the, the DPF and SCR technology take on that role. So we said, well, that's interesting, why did it fail? And we found out that you run it and you, lo and behold, you'll get this fuel that separates in the bulk tank. And when you run the engine, it's hard to start it. There's no energy in water. And, and then you turn your engine off, come back the next uh, Monday morning, try to start it. And lo and behold, after a few months of this, you've got corrosion in your fuel rail. So we said, well, goodness, we can fix this by, with some valving so that you make a little batch on board. And so you can always ensure that you're running on, when you're starting up and ending, you've got tank diesel or as good as the diesel can be. And then we'll switch the valves over because we can hook up to the brain of the truck over the CAN bus and say, okay, I'm at temperature, I'm at speed. Let's switch over to the water emulsion. And, and lo and behold, for, for example, we put 30% water into a, a diesel truck on a dynamometer, 65 miles per hour, 80,000 pound GVW, which is the maximum you can pull in Michigan, or the gross vehicle weight, so load and, and truck. We save 27.3% diesel fuel. Hmm. So, so the guys in the lab can't believe it. So, so this is why the diesel fuel doesn't come the, from the refinery full of water, because it would separate. So you have to mix it on board 
in order for this technology to work. That's how we see it working. The surfactant isn't long-lasting, and it doesn't tolerate heat cycling. And it's expensive. Yeah. So you want to use a little bit. It, it, what, what was happening is they would mix a, batch, a big batch, store it, but you would use 4 or 5% surfactant. We're using 0.15% surfactant, and we only need 10 minutes. Yeah. So we're recirculating this stuff so it's always fresh is the key to it. But, but, and so we go to these fleets and say, hey, try this out. And they say, what do you mean, water and diesel? And, and there's some I've been prog- trying to get that out for years. <laughs> and, and there's good reasons, too. But, but they're progressive guys. And we say, okay, try this out. And, and so here is this fella in, in El Paso, Texas, big fleet, big progressive fleet, wins all kinds of awards. He puts it on a brand new truck, which has a man, or uh, uh, I, actually, I won't say the name, but, but uh, he puts it on there and he says, okay. I would have, and, we, and these are research things, so we have zero water, 10% water, 20% water, 30% water. He goes to 30% water, and he says, well, let me drive up this mountain. And he drives up the mountain, drives back, and he couldn't believe it. Now, we can't say that, that we're going to sell that to those high-pressure common rail engines because there's still issues with, with water, and you have to look at longevity and things. But, but, you know, when we look at the truck market, they make, I think they're trying to make 200,000 Class 8 trucks a year, trying. So typically it's 140, 150, 160,000 per year in the United States. These trucks last 30, 40 years. When they retire here, they don't scrap them. They go south of the border. So when you look at the truck market, even though we have started to mandate, you know, these, these, these EGR uh, 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 Engine, uh, exhaust gas recirculation and all the SCR and DPF stuff, that's only since the last, say, 2008, 9, 10. It's really getting in, 2011, 13. Now you're getting stronger. Caterpillar dropped right out of that diesel market because they, the over-the-road diesel market because they didn't want to deal with it. Uh, so we see that high-tech stuff coming in. And don't we have uh, some regulation from EPA coming on heavy trucks? You saw it. You yeah. saw it. So, so, so that's going to build. So what we get now, it's been a horrible winter, as we all know. So we're getting a lot of truckers out there that, that this, what happens with, with the fuel, there's a lot of things in it that get so cold, it starts to gel which is a process of waxes falling out of the fuel and, and gelling up. So, so you get a problem with that, and it'll stop you dead. Uh, so that you would never want any water then. That's for sure. That's when you want less. Or, or it better be emulsified completely. Uh, so, but what, what is happening, when you try to generate 35 or 40,000 PSI with a, a, out of liquid with a pump, typically gear pumps, uh, they have these ceramic coatings on them, so, so you're trying to do that, and it's great. It works in the lab, like a lot of things, and then lo and behold, these things are starting to fail. So we've pressed that technology so high, and these things are so expensive, they're saying, well, you know, may, maybe it isn't all it's cracked up to be when you look at longevity. If you're a trucker, you need that thing to be reliable, even more so than anything. So they're paying top dollar and getting some fallbacks in reliability, uh, so, so that's where we think there might be a, a, a market for this diesel water emulsion. The emulsion system would, is great for the new trucks. When we talk about diesel water emulsion, though, you don't want to push it up to that kind of level. When you, when you compress that to that uh, high of pressure, those water, it, water is denser than, than uh, diesel fuel, and it wants to gel up. Water's like one big blob, only it's liquid, but it wants to stay together. So when it goes through the fuel rail, it compresses, and, and that's where on the newer trucks they have actually a return filter. So we have some trouble with, with water getting out of it. It's so small going in, you can make it through the primary and secondary filter, but when you compress it, it's, it and this is only on the brand new 2013, 2014 engines, where it compresses and gets stuck in this eight micron post filter. And the reason they have a post filter is because the fuel pumps are, are blowing up, and if you get, you get uh, ceramic dust in your fuel, it will get into the oil system eventually. And then you've got really problems, big problems when it gets to the main bearing. So your technology is for older trucks. If, if the emulsif- emulsification system, we can run on anything. And right now, these are, these are pretty big. You know, any, with anything when it's new, it's a pretty big form factor. And it's got a tank, so we mix it, put it in a tank. Uh, and, and then pull out of that. So that's the way we do the emulsification system. With the diesel water system, you have to sequester 
all of the return fuel. So there's, people don't realize that a whole lot of fuel is coming back as return fuel on a diesel engine. Uh, they use that to cool the ECM, they use it to cool the fuel rail. <laughs> so if you add water to that, you have to put it back in another tank. You wouldn't want to put it in your main tanks because then you, you, you don't want water in your fuel again. Emulsified water is a lot different than free water. So everybody's fighting free water, and that's our big, you know, it's a point of uh, understanding what it is. So what's the market saying? Are you guys going into production with this? Where do you stand? We, we are just ramping up uh, with this into production, So, which is an exciting time. It's starting to you know, get our supply chain in order. We order, you know, we're, we're looking, we, of course, you don't want to pay top dollar for these things. So Parker in Otsego, Michigan, we order uh, 3,200 special fittings, and they say, okay, eight weeks. So we're working through that and, and you know, tanks and boxes, and it, and it has to be DOT approved. We mocked it up just with, with hydraulic lines and things to make sure it was going to work with things you can get off the shelf. Uh, but now when you want to start selling it rather than trying it out, you've got to be on the money. So that's what we're in the middle of right now. So this is something that someone would retrofit onto their rig somehow? Yeah. You, you would take this and hang it to the side frame rail. And how oh, big is it? is it? Oh, picture uh, something that's uh, uh, 12 inches deep and 24 inches wide and 24 inches tall. That's the emulsion unit, uh, the, these, the diesel water emulsion unit. Of course, that needs a water tank. You need an emulsifier tank, and you need a tank to, to do all the valving in also. So it's a bit more involved. And what kind of cost does that add to the truck? The, the emulsifier unit is around $7,000, $7,000, dollars $8,000, and you have to install it then, which is, you know, some time and effort. Uh, the diesel water emulsion unit is, is looking to be around $14,000. But when you spend that kind of money on fuel, that's what's interesting. These truck guys will drive, oh, I think the average is around 125,000 miles a year. And so if you look at saving the fuel, they have a fuel cost of 70 to 90 to $100,000 a year per truck. So that's their biggest, you know, their biggest business driver is fuel. So if you can save them 5%, 10%, which is the emulsifiers that's, that's standard, then we came up with a water unit. And when you're at cruise control at, at highway speeds, you can save 15 to 18 to 20%. That's what really really says, wow, if I can do that, what's going on here? So the so, whole thing would be like the size of a refrigerator, if you got the whole... Like a little college fridge, if you thought about it that way. Okay. Yeah, at this form factor now anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, able to deliver better fuel efficiency, sounds like much lower emissions too. Much lower emissions. And the, and we don't get paid for emissions. Yeah. But, but, you and know, power and torque. Uh, good question. Uh, Water does not deliver uh, uh, power or torque. So typically these trucks are higher horsepower and, and we're advocating that you just do this when you're up at cruising speed. That's when we want the people to switch. When over. you don't need a whole lot of horsepower. When you don't need a lot of horsepower. We, we've done all kinds of crazy things to our own truck and people have run around and idled with it. The biggest problem is that if you're running with water in your fuel, you don't want to shut that truck off until you've cleared your fuel rail. That is the biggest thing and that's hard to and they have to manually remember to do that. What we do is hook up to the, to the computer on the truck, and as soon as they come to a lower speed, which we can program, so he goes down to 50 miles an hour, we switch over for him automatically. That's where we're at now. You Although go, some of the biggest improvements were at idle, the 30% at idle. You're not running that very often. If, 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 it, we ha and we've made these uh, uh, with the manual push buttons, but what we find is the guys forget to do it. Okay. And of course, since it's, it's a beta tester, we say, fine, you try it, you know, you get stuck, we pay the bill or things like this, but a lot of trucks don't have the, they don't have, lift, they don't have priming pumps on them, some of them. So it's difficult <clears throat> to send a guy out and tell him, hey, it's your fault when it's, you know, it's, it's got to be bulletproof. So, so what we try to do is take the driver right out of it. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah.
Like, but I still think that it seems like if okay, if the if the efficiency is up, if you're burning more of the fuel and less of it's turning into soot, then that could be additional power. Even though, yeah, the water's in there taking up space and not really doing anything. There are studies uh, that that say it seems to be having to do with the size of the water droplet. If you can get it small enough, there was a study that just came out in 2013. We subscribed to all these engineering journals, and it's interesting to see what's going on. <laughs> Uh, a lot of guys in in the uh, the Arab Emirates, UAE, some guys, some new companies in Germany that are after this right now. Some universities are really after it in India and Germany uh, that are saying, "Hey, this is working. Why aren't we doing it?" So we kind of, you know, and we're trying to. Because I saw one of those studies today, and the torque lines were up, you know, with each yeah. additional percent. So mm -hmm. it's true. It's true. But it. Our biggest problem was that we want to bypass the problems that made it fail back in the early 2000s. Even, even Lubrizol, which is a huge giant in the additive and chemical market, says we don't want any part of it anymore. <laughs> but this is because they were trying to sell a, like a package a prefab solution. fluid, right. just a drop in fuel, yeah. 20,000 gallons at a time, and yeah. You're, and your, your whole thing is, is that, no, we're going to do it at the point of use exactly exactly so we want to make two or three gallons at a time and, and so that's mixing this uh, so it's coming in to your unit mixing up then going into the exactly engine. so we use it and burn it use it and burn it so we have custom valves make it and swap it. over right yeah. now and uh, and that's what we're doing so there are there are companies for example that I think the port of Long Beach does a lot of studies with this San Diego does it some mining companies use this but that's all 24 7 stuff so if you never turn it off and you don't have the super high compression common rail injectors that are laser machined, you know, two to five micron holes in water. You know, water is not a lube, lubricizer. No. No. So, so that's where with the emulsion of the chemical, and we're working with a local company on that to develop it, that we add to that, and, and it adds those things so you can... You can well, and, and how about, you know, boats and, and, you know, locomotives and so forth? Is there any point in trying to do it in those as well? There are a lot of big ships that do this already. They're running on bunker fuel, and they will emulsify water with it to make it less viscous. What, That's going on bunk, right now. What is bunker fuel? That, that, that's like when it comes out of the ground as crude, the first step you can do with it is bunker crude. Yeah. That's yep. the first step in refining. Yep, so fractional distillation. There's the crude, bunker crude, then you go to, you know, the low quality diesels, and we get up to the low sulfur diesel, then we get up to kerosene and jet fuel, and then we get into the gasolines and up to gas. Huh. Yeah, yep. So, so there are a lot of the big ships are doing this already. What, what we have found, though, we have a system that runs on a 12-volt DC motor. So that was the key to the invention, is to, to make this miniature. If we have a lot of horsepower, we can shear it with a big pump. But, but you don't have a lot of horsepower, or you know, that's too much parasitic load, and that's why it's kind of been not thought about. So what happens to that fuel? You said that, so there's a... A, a tank that the the fuel that's not burned, but you're staying burned. out of that business at this point. Well, the high, high, high pressure with the returns. We we advocate that you use an emulsion system only on that. Right. And if and if you have if you have great fuel straight out of the refinery, you you maybe don't need us. But in reality, the fuel if if you have a problem with gelling, that's a problem with with. Stuff in your fuel, Junk, yeah. which there's trucks that had, it's been a horrible winter all year, which is a great winter for us. Uh, so it makes it evident of what's needed. So, so when you take that fuel and just shear it and mix it up so much, then it's much easier to burn. It actually even changes the color of it. So it makes it a lighter, lighter hue. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, look, uh, we've got a number of questions that have come in. I think we ought to get to the part of the program where we entertain some of the the viewers uh, questions about this so let me get right to it here uh, Eric Ambrose wants to know how does EGR affect it so exhaust gas recirculation uh, is is really outside of this so it's just taking the exhaust gases recircling them uh, kind of gets rid of that old blow by that the old trucks have uh, it lowers the temperature of the exhaust gas so you will see uh, you know, depending on what's going on, 
uh, lower lower exhaust gas temps. When, with the emulsion unit only on a dyno, I think it was five to eight percent lower. Hmm. When you start putting water in there, you you get a much higher uh, a drop in temperature. So it depends on how much water you want to put in it. Hmm. So it's it's a well documented thing. So it will lower those temperatures, which is the whole thing be, behind low temperature combustion, which is a a mandate from the EPA and one one of the president's goals is says. What, what are we going to do to get lower temperature combustion, which reduces NOx? Maverick uh, wants to know, is the result of this diesel water mixture injection similar to the low-tech aftermarket Edelbrock water injection unit for gasoline engines from the 1980s? The, the, I think this, the, the chemistry and the thought pattern was the same. Uh, what we're really after, you, you know, there are, when you go to a diesel truck pull, you'll see guys burn, they'll burn uh, more water than diesel fuel on these trucks as they go in there. So that, so when they do that, they use it to keep, they can put so much gasoline and they put so much water in there so the thing doesn't blow up from heat. So they can actually burn more gas when they add more water. But that's water going straight in. That's not going into the fuel. Correct. Yeah. yeah so, correct. so the, and of course we're, you know, we're trying to make, we're trying to find out how we can save money with this. So that's where you have a volumetric displacement with the water and the fuel. So, so you're kind of faking it out a little bit. Is there, is there an optimal mixture that? It's debatable. We, we see so many studies uh, throughout, you know, the, uh, the history of it, but I mean, we ran our truck on 50% water. You don't have much power, but it runs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would never start again if you turned it off. And you can probably throw away all the catalysts. What, what's funny, so what's cool. Funny, <laughs> yeah, what's funny is that here, you know, we, we're referencing these. So here's the University of Applied uh, uh, Science in Trier, Germany. They said, my gosh, we put in this water and our D DPF filter recycles only 20% of the time. So, so... You're just killing it. It's white smoke. It's not black smoke. So it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. Hmm. Carl Esposito wants to know, what is the fuel mile average of diesel trucks like Kenworth's and Peterbilt's? That's well documented. And an average depends on how fast you're going and how much load you're carrying. Uh, Industry-wide average is going to range between five, high fives to low sixes. Miles per gallon. Miles per gallon miles per gallon. Now, now, of course, the super truck uh, that's touted right now, I think their, average, their stated average was 10.7, or, or, or maybe that's the peak, but they're going 55 miles an hour, and you know it breaks down and, and things like this, so, so you got to be careful. A working average is really what a guy's getting on a long-term average. So, so when, you know, on our truck, we're getting into the eights, sometimes nines. We have a truck uh, that we have a bunch of uh, steel sheeting and water so we can change the loads and try it out. And, and we're getting, you know, just we haven't got any negative results on the test trucks or the fleets that we put them on. So it's, it's exciting. Hmm. Right Knight wants to know, why not introduce the water at the injector point, that way allowing the backflow to be diesel only? Ooh, well, it's, it's not, that, not that easy. Uh, the, the way a fuel system on a diesel works is you, you're, you're coming through a, a primary filter into a secondary filter, a lot of times into a, a lower pressure lift pump and then into a high pressure pump, into a rail, and then these piezo things or cam uh, fired injectors are, are firing. So you've got to be small. There, there's so, the, gear, the pumps themselves, you put water in them, they're going to kill themselves. But uh, the other part of it is you want the water inside the fuel. You want it to explode and that, have fuel all the way around it. Yes. And if it's going in there separately, that isn't happening. So exactly. right. you're only getting the cooling effect, not the exploding and atomizing effect. Exactly. And you have to stay away from the, 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 wa the water jet cutting effect. You know, water is very aggressive. We use that to cut steel. That's yeah. right. So you've got to encapsulate it in diesel fuel, otherwise you're going to kill it. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole argument between free water or the big thing for water. I don't want water. Well, this is not free water. This is emulsified water. You can have emulsified water. You can have solubilized water, which is, which is water that you can't even see. If you add enough surfactant or chemical, you mix it to a point where you, don't even, you can't even see it hardly on a microscope. So we've got a 2,500 power microscope that we look at to see how well this thing is working. And then we can measure these little bubbles to make sure they're small enough. That's great. Yeah.
Gary, I think this question is for you. VRM Chris wants to know, how many Chevrolet Volts are expected to be sold in 2014? As many as they can. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> it will sell no Volt until it's paid for. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say last year they did about 22,000, and they probably will not hit that this year, is my guess. ELR obviously will be drawing... Uh, no. <laughs> After the commercial. After the <laughs> thing will be on. So far this year, they've sold uh, 2,128, which is down 23.1% from last year, year to date. So, not good. Um, no, it's, a, it's kind of getting old in the market now, the Voltes. So. Yeah. And boy, it was, a, it was a hell of a deal last year when they started reducing the price and mm -hmm. putting all kinds of incentives on it. And yeah. it's like Malibu fault. I mean, it was crazy. So I'll guess that this year they'll sell 18,000 volts. That'd probably be a good number. Let's see. Uh, Mario Peretta says, will Sergio move production of the Charger 300 and Challenger out of Canada? The Canadian unions will have their hands tied behind their backs by 2016. Didn't they just announce this week that they're making an investment in Bramley? I didn't hear that. Yeah, I think they, because they said that they were going to be doing the the, um, the minivans, minivans in in Windsor, right? And then coincident with that was an investment in in, in Bramley. Oh, so okay. Good. that's yeah. where those come from. But okay. it, it's because it, when I was reading that, it, it didn't quite like. Wait a minute. Yeah, they don't make minivans up there, but. I think his angst, uh, Sergio's angst, was with with the Windsor and, and the, that plant there more so than the Brampton plant. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. what all the big talk was about. But yeah. but there you go. I mean, the the, the minivans are staying in Windsor, right? And uh, do you got, is that set is that set in stone now? I I think, I think that it's pretty is. much set in stone. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, there's well, what he said is he's not going after money from the Canadian right. government. Right. But they would they would invest in that plant in Windsor right. to do that. Yeah. So so yeah. I'd, uh, so, Mario, I think all the Canadian production from Chrysler is staying in Canada, at least for the time being. Um, let's see here. GM Veteran says, I do not understand how the Model S could be picked as the best overall recommendation by Consumer Reports. There are two main things that should prevent it from winning. One, range. Any of its gasoline competitors can travel twice as far in a tank of gas. And two would be price. This car is not priced anywhere near the average sedan in the U.S. Neither is a criteria that they look at. So you need a different um, in, 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 yardstick to figure that result. And the range isn't bad on the Model S. Um, no, but you probably can go four or 500 miles in most similar cars. It's not for that. This is, right. you know, if everyone would just look at the number of times they drive in a straight line 500 miles, you know, it's not that often, you know. But how many cars in its class can you go 400 miles in? Oh, I so would think of 7 Series you probably could. You think? Yeah. Just, I mean, the diesel it, for sure. Well, yeah, the diesel, but I mean, I'm just saying it, 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 it's not like a, a disproportionate disadvantage, you know, the whole and range. It would be a bigger deal if it, got, if it was a cheaper car. But you know what? The rich people don't drive to California from Michigan. They fly there. <laughs> because they're working. <laughs> yeah. They don't, they don't take any they don't take time August off. off. <laughs> hey, we got a phone call here. Let's bring that in, Ben. Hi, guys. This is Youngblood calling in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, luckily enough, in the uh, early 2000s, I was part of the Society of Automotive Engineers. And I was privy to some of the information from the uh, Lubrizol. They called it uh, Purinox back then. And I was privy to some of the results after the fact. And uh, they did get a 50% reduction in particulate matter, 15% in Nox. But along with that, they had it. Uh, they had problems with it dying when it was idling, difficulty starting when it was in the mor morning time and cold. Uh, excessive pollution if they weren't started only if they only started once a week, and back then they had a 10 to 15 percent loss of power. But I understand that your masturbation, cavitation, whatever it is, is the the thing that prevents all of this problems. I wish you the best of luck. It sounds like it might work, and I can just hope it does because the new engines with all their pollution equipments are pieces of crap. <laughs> They're going to kill the diesel market if they keep on putting all this pollution shit on them. It's not like driving an old lugging, torquing mech 
like the old days. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks, Later. John. Glad. He, he makes a good point uh, that, that uh, cer certainly those are the problems, and that's why we eliminate those problems by having a valving system to turn it on and off. You, you don't want to start it, and it, and it doesn't want to start with, with that in the fuel rail. Uh, we're seeing a, a backlash of, these, of the, the truck fleets that, that say, you know what, we want to use what's called a glider, which is you buy a brand new truck without an engine, and you take your engine or get an old Detroit Diesel Series 60 rebuilt engine that will run another million miles uh, and, and give you almost the same mileage, but they call it a pre-EGR engine, so you're exempt from, from all these new, new uh, uh, Regulation. regulations. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah. So, so and you look around the world, there's so, they make two, if they make 200000 a year, there's 2.3 million Class 8 semis on the road. So most of them are not the new stuff. So, so you could still make the argument that I'd rather have the old solid steam engine than the new one. It's, it's less expensive. It's less maintenance. You don't need to put the urea in it. You don't have to take the hit. All, all these new technologies for exhaust treatment are expensive, and, and they take a lot of maintenance. So there's a and they reduce fuel you know, economy because you're squirting diesel into the exhaust pipe. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So yeah. when, when somebody goes to the truck stop to get fuel, do they put water in as well? In that, it, well, it, of course, this isn't available to the market yet, but they would have to, yes. So if you're going to burn 20% water, you put 100 gallons of fuel, you need to add 20 gallons of water. So, and, and you know, you, you don't want just any water. Sometimes, if it's clean and drinkable water, that's fine, but you don't want anything with metals or salts in it. Uh, unless you've got one of these older engines, which will eat anything. <laughs> it, you know, then a biodiesel. Big hole. Biodiesel's not a problem then, because it'll eat anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, there's, uh, there, there's different classes of motors that you have to be cognizant of. Huh. We'll take uh, one more question here and then we'll wrap it up. But, uh, uh, this is in response to something that I said on today's AutoLine Daily, uh, in which I pointed out, you know, before, just a couple of years ago, my question always was, which car company will buy Tesla? I mean, once Tesla gets to a given level, who's going to buy it? Now, with their stock price through the roof and a market capitalization of $30 billion, I'm saying, who does Tesla want to buy? So uh, our Crux Flex from Twitter wrote in to say, I like today's AutoLine Daily. He says, I believe Tesla should buy Saab and bring it back to the American market. What's your opinion? I don't think that Elon would, would buy a car company because I, I just don't think he thinks that way. I, I, and Saab would be the very last one. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I agree. <laughs> but, I mean, why would he... Why would he do that. Well, I mean, no, I don't think he'll buy a car company. I sort of threw it out there just to stir the pot that who would have thought just two years ago, a year ago, six months ago, who would have thought that that Tesla would have a $30 billion market capitalization and you can leverage that equity sure. to do so much. It's just astonishing. But I, I, was, I was reading about uh, Musk today and and I was I was surprised to see that that SpaceX his his Space launch company his his launch company, um, you know he took on the joint venture of Lockheed and Boeing, and and beat them. Uh, and and I'm thinking, damn! How about that, an airline company to buy? Yeah, yeah but but right? yeah. I mean, it's yeah, just that's like, probably more like it. Is, yeah. I mean, isn't that astonishing? I mean, we, we, you know, that that this guy could do that. Yeah, you should buy Virgin Galactic. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And his solar company, I think, is holding its own. Yeah, but which uh, is that's rare. Yeah, but right. that, that really surprised me because you, you know Boeing is like so massive. I mean, it makes General Motors look like this. I mean, in its field, of course, right? I mean, because what else is there? Airbus. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's this guy took him on, and uh, pretty amazing. It's very amazing. Pretty amazing. That's a progressive company. There were a lot of guys in town that have went out there. Some came back. Some stayed. Right. Uh, so it's you know demanding, hot, long hours. It's old school. It is. Work, figure it out till you get it. It is. That's right. Yeah. A lot of Americans work there. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we should uh, wrap it up here. But uh, Calvin, thanks so much for coming on and explaining what you guys are doing with all this diesel emulsion. Fascinating topic. Really good stuff. Thanks for having us. We're excited about it. Yeah. We'll uh, keep pushing to make it happen.
Frank we, Mark? Yeah, we never mentioned it doesn't really work for cars. So us car people, we can't be looking to put diesel emulsion on the cars. Too short stop, start distances, well, et cetera, et cetera. You could simply emulsify. You could do it. We, we envision that. You know, if a big company, if 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 Tesla got a hold of it, you could you could you could uh, downsize. They really don't need it. You could downsize it. And, you know, the, the key to anything is to integrate it right into the design up front, and that's really probably what. So maybe somewhere down the road, this could work for pass cars. I would think you. Could, so so the you principle could, could be applied integrated. to it. Oh yes. Wow. Certainly. Okay. Certainly. Yep. But 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 if you still go with the ultra high compression or, 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 or pressure common rail, you're not going to want to put water in there. Uh, but but if you wanted to back down from that, uh, and then there's economic uh, sense that says you might want to do that. Hmm. If a lower tech engine is less expensive, if the reliability is higher, and if you could use something like water, then you could save money and, and uh, eat cake too. Hey, hey. Yeah. All right. Frank Marcus, thanks for being here with us tonight. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Sure used your expertise tonight. Yeah. That was great. Welcome home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, good being with you too. John. Okay. And we should thank everybody who's been watching and listening and join us again next week. We've got a great show coming up then too. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern. Get your daily news fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There is all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.